I'm just glad to be here today and to get to share the Word of God. We're in a series called From Manger to Majesty that we've been talking about. Open your Bibles to the book of Revelations, if you would, with me, chapter 1 this morning. And we're just excited about uh, what God is going to do this morning. I I noticed something about your pastor, too. We kind of look alike. I don't know if you guys notice that or not, but uh, there's a direct resemblance there for some reason. And uh, he's a handsome guy. How many of you know that? (laughs) We, uh, for the last several weeks, we've been looking at this series. And today, what a great place to conclude in this fourth week of this series in the book of Revelations. And uh, I was thinking last night about how many times that I've read these 22 chapters. I was thinking about last night how many times that I preached on these 22 chapters of this book of Revelations. I told my wife last night about 1.30, I said, I'm just laying here thinking about uh, all of the times that I've taught this series of Revelations. She said, I bet that you've changed your thoughts on a lot of opinions on a lot on that book from the first time that we pastored when I was 25 years old till now, none of your business how old I am. I bet you've changed your mind a lot about it. I said, yeah, I really have. But it's an incredible book, this book is. And uh, we uh, I, I often hear a number of people say to me, you know, I don't like to read the book of Revelations because uh, it's kind of scary and I don't understand it. And it is true, there's a lot of symbolism in this book. I mean, you know, there's dragons and beasts and they're more than one-headed creatures and there's the 666, the Antichrist, and there's ten horn creatures and, you know, there's, there's judgments and wars and all these kind of things going on. While all of that is true, there, it, there is a lot of symbolism. The truth is about the book of Revelations, it is really about about the one that we love so much who is going to soon return. And as he is returning, the events that will unfold during that period of time. So when you when you look at the book of Revelations, rather than looking at it as a book hard to understand and difficult to, to you know, draw out all the symbolism, really what you need to know is in Revelations 1 and verse 1, it is really nothing more than the revelation of Jesus Christ. In fact, I love how the book opens and I really love how it ends. It is, verse 1 says in the first chapter, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And in the 22nd chapter, the last word of the last verse, it says, amen. Isn't that great? It, it opens up with, this is a story about Jesus Christ, the one that we love. It is the unfolding events when he returns to the earth again. And, and as sure as we're alive, it's going to happen. Amen. And that's really, you know, all that needs to be said about that, because that's really kind of what it is. Verse three, there's a bonus though. I want you to see, it says, blessed is he who, re- who reads and, and, and the, hears the words of this prophecy, and check this out, and keeps those things which are written in them, for the time is at hand. So there is a special bonus blessing if you read it and you understand it. You know, the first time I read the book of Revelations, I was as lost as a goose, really. I just didn't have any idea what was going on in places uh, uh, in this book and what the symbolism, didn't have a clue. But I just kept reading it and kept reading it and kept reading it and studying it. And, and eventually it began to come together like a jigsaw, jigsaw puzzle. How many of you ever seen a puzzle and it's missing so many pieces, you can't tell what you're putting together. But then eventually it begins to come together and you begin to understand it and see it more clearly. And then how many of you know, when all of the pieces of the puzzle are together, my goodness, you got a beautiful picture of what's going to take place. If you keep reading, that's what will happen to you in the book of Revelations. And by the way, I just want to say, and I meant to say this when I was getting started, Nick, wherever you are, I'm so proud of you. And uh, let me just say this, Nick, I heard a preacher once say this, and I thought it was uh, wonderful. There you are. I'm looking all over for you, but I can't hardly see anyway. So it's just amazing just to get to see you out there. Uh, a, a preacher, a wise preacher, an old wise preacher said this. <clears throat> he brought the missionary into his office before the church started. And he said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to Russia. He said, why aren't you there? He said, well, <laughs> kind of stumbled over his words. He said, well, because I don't have the money. He said, then you go tell my church that. The only reason I'm not there is because you guys haven't sent me. It takes money to get there. No other church is going to love him with finances like his own church. So when this is over, 
I encourage you, go see him. You too, honey. You take our checkbook and go see him. A little history here as we get started. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the opportunity to share about this incredible book of Revelations. And thank you for the revelator, the one who revealed himself to John. And we just ask you to bless every person in this room today as we look at it together in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Snapshots of Revelations. That's the title this morning. First, a little history. The book of Revelations was written by one of the most beloved disciples, uh, the beloved John. You probably know at this point when this book was written that out of the 12 disciples, Judas hung himself after uh, the, the death of Jesus And then the other 10 were martyred eventually as they preached the gospel throughout society. They were martyred. And now it's come to the point in 95 AD, about 62 years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that the only living apostle or disciple of Jesus is was John the beloved and he was sent for preaching the gospel he was sent to an island which was would kind of be like Alcatraz in our modern day uh, he was sent to the island called Patmos for the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ while he was there on this island he receives the most incredible revelation of Jesus Christ and that is the book that we're looking at this morning the Lord revealed these incredible things to him on this island. He wrote them down and he sent them to the various churches. By the way, we'll not cover it today for time's sake, but he sends a letter to each one of the churches that Paul had started in Asia Minor and encouraging them and both pointing out some problems in the churches. And we won't cover that today, but then he goes on and he reveals the incredible Jesus Christ and the unfolding of the events that will happen in the end time. By the way, you hold in your hand, I want to make you aware of this, you probably already know it, but you hold in your hand this morning, if you're holding the Bible, you hold in your hand the only book in the world that tells how everything began. It tells us how the beginning started in Genesis 1, and it tells us how everything is going to end way before the ending of it, and and you, and you hold in your hand the only book in the world that tells the beginning and the end by the only person who was there to see it. Isn't that incredible? Now, we have a lot of other people who wasn't there that tries to tell us that it didn't happen that way, but that's okay. But we have the only book in the world who the author of it all tells us how it began and tells us how it's going to end. Incredible. Uh, Jesus was there in the beginning. John chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. So Jesus was there in the beginning. He was already there. And check this out. I, you, you can comprehend this good. He's already in the end. That's, that's, that's above, that's above me. But let me just say it above. It helps me to understand it a little better this way. If I say it to this, this way to myself, he stepped out. He stepped into time. Check this out. He stepped into time and he revealed himself as the savior of the world. And then he stepped back out of time and he brought it to pass. There is no time with God. Somebody say amen. Amen. He stepped into time to reveal himself as the savior of the world, and then he stepped back out of time to bring it to pass. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the one who uh, is declared in this book, the Jesus, and how this will affect, how he will affect the coming days at the end of time. First of all, number one, this book reveals Jesus as the Alpha and the Omega. Look at verse 7 of chapter 1, and it says this, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him, even so, amen. Verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, 
the Almighty. Come on, say a good amen. I am the beginning and the end. It's interesting. The word alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet, and the word omega is the last letter in the Greek alphabet. If we were saying it today, we could just simply say Jesus is the A and he's the Z. He's the A and he is the Z. I like to say it like this. He's the first page in the book. He's the last page in the book. And he's every page in the middle of the book. Come on, somebody. He's the first and he is the last. He is the beginning and he is the end. He was before and he will forever be. Hallelujah. He was there before the world existed and he'll be there when it's all over. Come on, say a good amen. What does that mean to you and me? It means don't worry. Don't be troubled. He, he is everything. Uh, verses 13 through 17, same chapter. In the midst of the seven golden candles, in the midst of the seven candlestick, one likened to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his foot and a girt about his paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hair was white as wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were a flame of fire. His feet was likened to fine brass, as if they had been burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he said, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his stream. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Fear not, I am the first. And I am the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. Hallelujah. What an incredible verse of scripture. This just tells us, listen, when the Lord said he would never leave you or never forsake you, he meant it. He's going to be there all the way through. I love verse 18. I'm he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death, hell. Everything belongs to him. That encourage, it encourages my faith so much. Hallelujah. He said he'll never leave me or forsake me. He'll never leave us or forsake us. He, listen, when you think about it, the takeaway is this. Whatever happens in the end of time, whatever happens in the end of time, he's going to be with you. Whatever happens in the end of time, whatever happens in your future, whatever happens in the history, here's what you can know. You can know he's going to be with you. Now, I don't know about how that impacts your life, how that makes you feel, but I'll tell you one thing. My wife has made me that same promise, that whatever happens in our life, if we're, if we're bountiful, if we're, if we're broke, whatever happens, she's going to be with me. If I'm sick, she's going to be with me. If I'm healthy, she's going to be with me. If I'm happy, she's going to be with me. If I'm ugly, she says she's still going to be with me. That encourages me a lot. What does that mean? That just means to me that whatever I go through, whatever I face, I can count on the fact that she's going to be there. Now listen, that just means that when I go through whatever, I know I'm going to have a, a friend that's sticking close to me. I'm going to have somebody beside me, and we're going to walk this out together. And just the fact that she's going to be there is very comforting to me. I want to tell you this. When I read the book of Revelations the first time, it was pretty scary. But after I realized that he is the Alpha and the Omega, he is the beginning and the end, he's the first and the last, and he has promised that he'll forever be with me. It really doesn't matter. Dragons, come on. It added Christ. No big deal. Listen, if he is with us, then everything's going to be okay. And that's the takeaway here. Jesus is letting you know in the very first portion of this book that he is everything and he is with you. And if he controls everything and he's in and he's all powers given to him and he is everything, he possesses the keys of death and life, of hell and everything else, then you needn't worry about anything. Give the Lord a hand clap. He, he's pretty awesome. He's pretty awesome. Thank you. <clears throat> And it's, it's, old. it's tough when you get old, isn't it? You have to have glasses, tissue, water. Can you think of anything else that I need while I'm... Oh, wow. Incredible. 
He's going to be with me. Say he's with me. It ought to make everything better just knowing that as you read revelations or do just whatever happens. He's going to be with you. He's going to be with you. Hallelujah. That's comforting. Number two, secondly, another incredible revelation of Jesus in this book is he reveals himself as the Lamb of God. In fact, 28 times in the book of Revelations, Jesus is revealed as the Lamb of God. In chapter 5, John is, in fact, turn over to chapter 5 with me. In, In chapter 5 of Revelations, John is receiving this revelation from Jesus in Revelations 5. As he's receiving this, in fact, if you look uh, while you're there, just flip back one page. In chapter 4, he sees this incredible throne in chapter 4. Uh, if, if you have a good Bible, it'll say something like the throne or heavenly worship in the, before the chapter starts. And he looks and he sees this incredible throne and one that sets up on it. And he sees uh, all of these incredible um, colors and, and beauty and splendor. Everything's majestic and a crystal river and just all of this incredible stuff. And he's, as he's looking at all of this stuff, you know, he sees, and we go to chapter five, he's receiving this revelation uh, uh, of the one who is sitting on the throne. And, and, and then the, and something incredible happens. He sees a book. He sees a book. And the book is sealed with seven seals. And so here's this picture. There's this throne. It's all majestic. It's incredible. All of these amazing sights John is seeing. He's trying to describe them to us. And then one steps forward with the book. I don't know if it was the one from the throne or just who it was, but there was this book and it was sealed up with seven seals. At some point, the angel gives a shout out and here's what he says. Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals. Now, when you read this, it's really incredible. In fact, I want you to see this with your own eyes. In, in John chapter 5, he, he, one steps forward and says, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals? And then verse 4, check this out. He's watching all this, and it says that John wept. He began to cry because as they looked around, no one was worthy to open the book. Now, what is the book? The book is helping us to understand what are the events that will unfold in the book of Revelations. What are the things that are going to happen at the end of time? So here's, here's this book, and the, and, and the angel has stepped forward, and he says, okay, who among you is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals? And they looked around, and here's what they saw. No one was worthy. No one was worthy to open the book and to loose the seals. So John begins to cry. What a picture. And all of a sudden, as he begins to cry, when you see what happens in, in verse 5, check this out. It's really, really incredible. I'm going to read down from verse 5 to verse 14. Follow along with me now. One of the elders said to me, weep not. Somebody say, weep not. <laughs> weep not. Behold, the lamb of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, look, check this out, everybody. I beheld and in the midst of the throne and the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came, and you imagine this imagery now. Imagine this. Now, now, everybody look up here for just a minute. Stop reading for just a second. Look up here. Imagine now. I don't know how many people there. could have been millions and millions of people, angelic beings, the throne of God. It's all so beautiful. It's amazing. And they pull out this book, and they say, who is worthy? No one is worthy. And then John has got his head down, and he's crying. And, and the guy beside him, one of the elders said, hey, look up. Don't cry anymore because behold the Lamb of God. And as he looks up, he sees this incredible imagery of a lamb that had been slain. Read along with me, verse 7. He came and took the book 
out of his right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the 20 elders fell down before the lamb, having every one harps and vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, check it out, everybody. You know, we sang this song here this morning. I noticed that in a couple of our songs this morning, we were singing the same words. You are worthy to take the book. Worthy is the lamb to open the seals thereof and that you were slain and have redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred tongue, people, and nation. Somebody say you are worthy. Oh, hallelujah. You are worthy to open the book and to, and, and to loose the seals. Verse 10, you have made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And behold, I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beast and the elders, and the number of them were, check this out, everybody. Oh, this is so amazing. Ten thousand times ten thousands and thousands and thousands saying with a loud voice worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and in the earth such as are, are in the sea and all of them that are her heard say blessing honor glory Power unto him that sitteth upon the throne and the Lamb. Hallelujah. Can you imagine that? Now, have you got this picture? I'm sorry, I'm, st I'm just a, I'm still a little bit of a titty baby when I think about this. But can you imagine this picture? John's got his head down and he, he, he sees this incredible picture, a lamb as it had been slain. And then he hears thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And it didn't say they were worthy as the. They were crying out with a loud voice. Worthy is the lamb. Worthy is the lamb who has been slain. Hallelujah. Can you imagine? Incredible, incredible stuff we're seeing here. Now, what is the takeaway here? The takeaway is early in the Old Testament, <clears throat> Moses introduces the concept of a lamb. And in order to have your sins covered back in that day, you had to kill the lamb and offer the sacrifices. And that continued all the way up to the time of Christ. John the Baptist said, behold the lamb of God. Revelation, and listen, the New Testament tells us we all know that there's not a lamb anywhere that can take our sins away. There is no lamb in the pasture anywhere pure enough, good enough, clean enough, perfect enough to cover our sins. In fact, we're told many times in Hebrews that there is no, there's, there's no atonement through that. It was a temporary method of getting us to the lamb. But thank God, Revel Revelations introduces us to the one. Listen to this. He doesn't just take our sins away for this year, but he takes our sins away. Hallelujah. He covers us. Hallelujah. In fact, listen, in order for you to understand this fully, the Bible gives us some pictures of this. He says he, he cast it into the sea of forgetfulness. It's as far as the east is from the west. You're not going to find him anymore. The lamb has shown up. He has appeared. He is, he is worthy. He's covered you. He's taken your sins away. Give the Lord a good clap offering, everybody. <clears throat> Isn't that good? Behold the Lamb. Now, a lot of imagery going on there, but you understand the Lamb is Jesus, and they are beholding him as the covering of the sins of the world. Incredible stuff. So he is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the Lamb of God. Number three, third, Revelation, he reveals Jesus as the righteous judge. Now, this is the biggest portion of this book, the righteous judge. <clears throat> he is coming to judge the world, and that's so true. Jesus is coming to judge the world. In Revelations chapter 6 through 18, if you're taking notes, in Revelations chapter 6 through Revelations chapter 18, 
a number of judgments are released on this ungodly time period of mankind, beginning with the here of these seals. Did you know, if you notice, as the seals were opened, remember uh, John saw, uh, here was a book and it was set, sealed with seven seals. No one was worthy to open the book. And the Lamb of God appears, Jesus, and he, they start saying, oh, you are worthy. Oh, you, are, you are worthy. You've been slain. You've covered our sins. And so he takes, and you know what he does? He opens the seals. And when he opens the seals, you know, if you've never read the book of Revelations, you, don't, you probably don't know what happens. But if you do, then you know what happens. A white horse goes forth and it brings judgment upon the world. And then we see a red horse. He opens the second seal and a red horse goes and we see blood and war and destruction and all kinds of things. And then a black horse goes forth and we see death and destruction and all these judgments being poured out upon the world. And then a pale horse goes forth and we see all these judgments. So every time he opens these seals, we see these incredible judgments going out upon the world. And then if you flow on in the book of Revelations, you come to chapter 8 and there are these seven trumpets. And when these trumpets sound, you know what happens? Judgments are poured out on the earth. And they're incredible judgments. When you read them, they're just, they're, they're, they affect everything. The water, the sun, the, the sea, the everything, the moon, every part of our society is affected. Chapter 16, you see seven vials poured out upon the earth. And when you read them, they're so incredible. They just, this it's horrible. You know, you find yourself vexed with sores. Men are vexed with sores. Water contaminated, fish is dead, blood in the rivers. Like, you know, a lot of like, a lot of like the judgments that you see in the time of Moses. Same type of thing. Destruction everywhere. Judgment is being poured out and then darkness comes and demonic spirits are released. Incredible stuff happening. And, 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 and listen to this. Everybody look up here for just a minute. All of these things are being poured out on the world because God is giving them one last opportunity to repent before he destroys them. And you know what the Bible says in Revelations? Instead of repenting, they harden their heart just like Pharaoh did. Do you understand that everything you see in Exodus, what happened with Moses a picture of the lamb, a picture of, a picture of the deliverer, a picture of the one who would bring them out. Come on, that's a picture of Jesus. The judgments that are being poured out upon Pharaoh, which is a picture of the world and all that was taking place in that time. And then the church getting out of there, children of Israel getting out of there and heading toward the promised land, everybody. It's the same picture of what's gonna take place. And did Pharaoh repent? No, he hardened his heart and he went right after him. And finally, the final judgment was God destroyed him. And that's exactly what's going to take place in the book of Revelations. But before it does take place, you see these incredible judgments being poured out. There's an old saying, and I want to share this with you because I feel like this is so important for somebody in this room. I started to write this down and then I decided not to. And then it was like something said, say it. So let me, just, let me just say this, an old saying that says, we don't have to take matters in our own hands and try to settle every score or make all the wrongs right. You know why? Somebody's done something to you and you just feel like you have, you just feel like you need to make that wrong right or you just feel like you need to settle that score or whatever. I'm gonna tell you something. There is a righteous judge coming one day and he is gonna judge every single person who's ever lived. And here's what we wanna do as the children of God. We wanna do the things that are right so we can stand before, or actually we can kneel before that righteous judge and we can, and we can have confidence that we've been covered by the blood of Jesus. You don't need to right every wrong. Someone has borrowed money for you. Somebody's, somebody's taken advantage of you. Somebody's molested you. Somebody's hurt you. Somebody's lied to you. Somebody's cheated you. Somebody's done something to you. Put it in the hands of the righteous judge. And the day will come where God is going to make all the wrongs right. Listen, the Bible is very clear. As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me. Every tongue shall confess to God. And every one of us are going to give an account of ourselves to God. Every king that's ever lived, every choice, every president who has ever made, every person in Congress, every person in society, right on down to the poorest of people, everyone will get, listen, there'll be no big eyes in those days and little use. Everybody's going to stand before God. And what you want to do is you want to be in right standing with God. <clears throat> we spend a lot of our lives trying to even up things <laughs> that we need to put in the hands of God. <clears throat> um, the day's coming. 
where the righteous judge is going to appear. And it's going to be a time of making all things right. In chapter 16, I wanted to, we, we moved, in case you didn't know it, we moved from chapter 5 all the way to chapter 16. If you're wondering why I'm talking fast, we only have 22 chapters here. Chapter 16, look at verse 5. And I heard the angel of the waters say, check this out, everybody, all these judgments have been poured out from chapters 6 to chapter 16. People wouldn't repent, and, and don't you know it was hard on Jesus judging his own creation? I'm going to tell you, I'm, I'm a father of four kids, and I'm a grandparent of what soon will be ten, nine at the present. And I'm going to tell you right now, is I've never spanked any of my grandkids, and my wife did most of the spanking of our kids. Not because they didn't need it, they did, but I just, I just hate that part of parenting. I hate that part. Anybody who likes to beat on their kids, we need to talk when the service is over, okay? I just want to tell you, just meet me in my office. We need to have a little time together. <clears throat> if I, an, a, a worldly, sinful-natured human being, don't want to hurt my kids, even if they need it and they're begging for it. I heard Pastor stand up here the other day and say, go ahead and beat your kids. It ain't going to kill them. That's Bible. So go on, their kids need a spanking. They need one. They sometimes, my, my dad whooped all of us sometimes when just one needed it. He said, all of you need it. That ain't righteous. <laughs> I'll tell you right now, that ain't righteous. But anyway, if, if it hurts me to spank my kids, don't you think for a moment that a good God enjoys pouring out judgment on his people. He does not. He does not. God is love, and he has a wonderful plan for our lives, but we've got to fit into that plan. And God, let me tell you, in fact, if you look at these verses, you can feel you can feel how he feels when, when, when a group of angels have to say in verse 5, you are righteous for doing this. Can't you feel him hurting? As he's pouring out these judgments, they say, you are righteous for doing this, O Lord. You are righteous, which art and was and shall be, because you have judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and they have given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. In other words, listen, the truth is, there are some people who deserve the most severe judgment. I'm not that person to give them that judgment. We have courts in the lands. We have, we have laws, we have, we have people who enforce those laws. I'm not the person to do that. But I want to tell you something. I do believe in capital punishment. I believe that there are crimes severe enough where persons are to receive the maximum penalty, penalty for that crime. But I want to tell you something. It breaks the heart of God. You can see it here. That to the point that they have to say, look, you are still worthy and righteous for doing this. Because they deserve what they're getting. Listen, isn't that incredible that the God who loves us so much doesn't want to judge us? He's doing these things to cause us to repent so he can receive us, and they refuse. <clears throat> so Jesus reveals himself as the righteous judge. N next, number four. We only have five of these. Let me, get, let me get wound up here. Jesus next reveals himself in the book of Revelations as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. Come on. King of kings and Lord of lords. Uh, in, in chapter 19, verse 11, it says this, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he set upon him is called faithful and true. And in righteousness, watch this, in righteousness he doth judge and make war. He's doing what is right. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen and white and clean. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and he would smite the nations, and he would rule them with a rod of iron. And he tread the winepress in the fierceness of his wrath of Almighty God. And he had on his vesture and on his thigh a name that was written, King of Kings. And Lord 
of lords. Hallelujah. Can you picture this now? I don't know about you guys, but I, I do pictures better than I do anything else in my brain. My vein, brain functions on a low level. It's picture level, right? Okay. And so I picture this so many thousands of times in my mind. Here he's coming back to receive his people and he's on a white horse. Man, this is incredible stuff. And thousands and thousands. And can you imagine if the sky were to light up right now with horses coming from heaven and we see this incredible being and he's riding a white horse and on his thigh and his vesture dipped in blood and his thigh and upon his, uh, there's a name written King of kings and Lord of lords. Man, you know, there's a choir that sing that out. It's about as wonderful as anybody. King of kings. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Lord of lords. I've pictured it a thousand times. Man, you know, the president of the United States comes with a lot of fanfare, airplanes, bands, marching bands. Did you notice when George H. Bush, George Herbert Bush passed away. All of the incredible bands and fanfare, he deserved all of it. All, anybody who serves in that office, God bless them. But I'm going to tell you something. He was the president of the United States, and that's, that's a lot. The, the leader of the free world. But I want to tell you, Jesus is not just king. He's not a king. He is the king of kings. He's not just the Lord. He is the Lord of lords. Come on, somebody. Give him a good hand today. King of kings and Lord of lords. <clears throat> and finally, number five, the book of Revelation reveals Jesus as one of the most special and amazing things you could ever want to hear. It reveals him as the bridegroom. Now imagine that. We go from all of this splendor and power and majestic beings and all of these things, and it comes to a conclusion with Jesus revealing himself as the bridegroom. Incredible. Who's the bride? <laughs> now you've seen these weddings. We went to one the other day in Conroe. It was very beautiful. It was a super nice wedding, and I saw something really amazing, y'all. I saw the groom. It was time for the bride to come in, and she came in, and we all stood up. King of kings. Mm -mm -mm. Here he comes, you know. Yeah, we all stood up, and I looked at her, and she was gorgeous. I turned to see what he was thinking. It was amazing. I saw this with my own eyes. It was, I'm glad I saw this. But he was going. He was, wasn't he? He was blowing. Like, I need to cool down. I need to cool down. It's got hot in here. Listen. This is so incredible. Jesus Christ reveals himself as the bridegroom. Now check this out, everybody. This is so amazing at the close of this book. In the Jewish custom, the groom would have to go to prepare a place for the bride. And he would have to ask his father. He's putting together, this was a long time ago. It's not like building a new house but it was a place. And he would ask his father, is that good enough? The father would say, not good enough. You need to tighten up here a little bit. You need to fix that up a little bit. You need to better that a little bit. And he would say, father, is that good enough? Is that good enough? Is that good enough? And the minute that he finished, the place that he had prepared for her, the father would say, Go get your bride. And that's why you read in places in the Bible that if behold, the bridegroom comes at midnight because they didn't know what time he would finish up. They didn't know what time he would be prepared. They didn't know what time to be prepared. You know, we read in another place that said, if you knew what time the bridegroom was coming, 
you would have been prepared. But they didn't know. So the, the bridegroom, he would just go at whatever time he would finish and he would get his bride and he would bring her home and he would give her the place that he's prepared for her. Now listen, everybody, Revelations ends on a very high note. It is Jesus Christ coming after his church. And when he comes after his church, he catches his church away. And the Bible says that he has gone to prepare, and, and John, John, it says this, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Hallelujah. He's prepared a place. What kind of place? When is he coming back? As soon as the Father gives him word. How many of you know Jesus himself doesn't know when he's coming? He's preparing a place. He didn't know how many for maybe. I don't know what all he knows, what he doesn't know. But he doesn't know himself what day the Father. But there is coming a day, ladies and gentlemen, where the Father will say to Jesus, the time has come. Go get your bride. And the Bible says he will return and he will take us home to a place. Now listen to this. The Bible says this. It says, I has not seen. <laughs> I always like to say it like this, y'all. This tickles me to death. If Jesus can speak the world into existence in seven days, all of this in seven days, how long has he been gone? How long has he been gone? What can he do in a thousand years? Here's what the Bible says. Eye has not seen. Ear has not heard the things that he has prepared for you. Eye has not seen. Ear has not heard. Listen, they are at this very moment preparing a wedding feast in heaven for all of you folks and every believer that has ever believed in Jesus Christ, a banquet like you've never seen before. A bride is about to receive the groom and the time is drawing near. Now, I want to end with this verse in fact, did I read verses 9 and 10 of uh, Revelations 21? I don't think I did. Let me read that real quickly. Revelations 21, 9 and 10. you got to have a plan, I guess. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me. Watch this, everybody. Come here. I want to show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and he showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God. Oh, and he uses the next number of verses to tell you about some of the splendor and the beauty and the majesty of the place that he is preparing. An eternal land that is so amazing that we cannot even think that high. I want to end with Revelations 22. Band, come on, and singers, help me. I want to end with, turn one more page. Revelations 22. I want to end with what I believe to be two of the most powerful verses in the closing chapters of this book. Look at it with me. Verse 6. And he said to me, these things that I'm telling you, these things that I'm showing you, these things that are written in this book, are faithful, and they're true. And the Lord God, it doesn't get any bigger than that. And the Lord God of the holy prophets has sent his angels to show you. You know, I think John was having this revelation. You ever, you ever have a dream and you go, oh my goodness, could that be real? Could that be real? I bet John thought, I believe, I'm losing my mind. So here's what the angel says to him. John, everything you've seen is faithful and it's true. And check this out. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angels to show this to you, his servant, the things that must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth these sayings of the prophecies of this book. I want you to bow your heads with me. Close your eyes for just a moment. <clears throat> as sure as I'm standing here today sharing this with you, 
these things that I just shared with you will happen. You can count on it. I only have one question with every head bowed and every eye closed. I just have one question in closing this morning. Are you ready? Are you ready? At the dawn of a new year, there's no better time to get rid of some things in your life that you, that you need to get rid of, to let go of some stuff in your life that you know you need to let go of, to forgive, to get right with God, to turn loose of the things from last year that you've picked up in the journey. We're at the threshold of a brand new year. And I want to tell you, we're one year closer to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. More importantly, the way we live dictates our eternal future. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're in this building right now and you say, I want next year to be different in my life. I have some things in my life next year. I want them to be different than what they were this year. I want to encourage you right now, wherever you are in this building, don't hesitate or wait. Just come on down to the altar. Kneel down and just say, Jesus, you have revealed yourself to me as the Savior. You have revealed yourself to me as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You have revealed yourself to me as the bridegroom. You have revealed yourself to me as the righteous judge. And I'm coming today to give my life totally and completely over to you. And listen, if you need forgiveness in this house, this is the this is a wonderful place to just come and kneel before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. If you need, if you need a touch from God today, listen, if you're battling some kind of addiction, if you've got something in your life that you can't seem to shake, I want to tell you right now, he holds all power is in his hands. Come to him, kneel before him, give your life totally to him, submit your life to completely over to him and let him touch you this morning. Hallelujah. Prayer partners, I wanted to do this a little different this morning because we're at the threshold of a brand new year and I believe it's a marvelous time to start in a right place with God, in a right place with our own lives, in a right place in our own families or whatever that may look like. And so I'm going to ask you, prayer partners, in just a moment, as you feel led, if you want to come and just lay your hand on someone and pray for them, you feel free to come on and do that now. Man, come on and sing something. I believe there are more people could come this morning and bow before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and say, look, Jesus, do a work in my life. If it's not too late, if that's you, come right on. Pastor, come too when you get a chance. God bless you. Come on, sing, ladies and gentlemen. Let's pray together all over this building.